beautiful, says Octavia. When she's older, says Venia almost grimly, then he'll have to let us. Do what? Blow up my lips like President Snow's? Tattoo my breasts? Dye my skin magenta and implant gems in it? Cut decorative patterns in my face? Give me curved talons or cat whiskers? I saw all these things and more on the people of the capital. Do they really have no idea how freakish they look to the rest of us? The thought of being left to my prep team's fashion whims only adds to the miseries competing for my attention. My abused body, my lack of sleep, my mandatory marriage, and the terror of being unable to satisfy President Snow's demands. By the time I reach lunch, where Effie, Cinna, Portia, Hamish, and Peta have started without me, I'm too weighed down to talk. They're raving all about the food and how well they slept on the trains, and everyone's all full of excitement about the tour. Well, everyone but Hamish. He's nursing a hangover and picking at a muffin. I'm not really hungry either. Maybe because I loaded up on too much rich stuff this morning, or maybe because I'm so unhappy. I play around with a bowl of broth, eating only a spoonful or two. I can't even look at Peta, my designated future husband, although I know none of this is his fault. People notice, try to bring me into the conversation, but I just brush them off. At some point, the train stops. Our server reports that it will not just be for a fuel stop, but some part has malfunctioned and must be replaced. It will require at least an hour. This sends Effie into a state. She pulls out her schedule and begins to work out how the delay will impact every event for the rest of our lives. Finally, I just can't stand to listen to her anymore. No one cares, Effie! I snap. Everyone at the table stares at me. Even Hamish, who you'd think would be on my side in this matter, since Effie drives him nuts. I'm immediately put on the defensive. Well, no one does! I say, and get up to leave the dining car. The train suddenly seems stifling, and I'm definitely queasy now. I find the exit door, force it open, triggering some sort of alarm, which I ignore, and jump to the ground, expecting to land in snow. But the air is warm and balmy against my skin. The trees still wear thick, wear, ugh, the trees still wear green leaves. How far south have we come in a day? I walk along the track, squinting against the bright sunlight, already regretting my words to Effie. She's hardly to blame for my current predicament. I should go back and apologize. My outburst was the height of bad manners, and manners deep mattered deeply to her. But my feet continue along the track, past the end of the train, leaving it behind. An hour's delay. I can walk at least 20 minutes in one direction and make it back with plenty of time to spare. Instead, after a couple of hundred yards, I sink to the ground and sit there, looking into the distance. If I had a bow and arrows, would I just keep going? After a while, I hear footsteps behind me. It'd be Hamish, coming to chew me out. It's not like I don't deserve it but I still don't want to hear it. I'm not in the mood for a lecture. I warn the clump of weeds by my shoes. I'll try to keep it brief. Peter, said, Peter takes a seat beside me. I thought you were Hamish, I say. No, he's still working on that muffin. I watch as Peter positions his artificial leg. Bad day, huh? It's nothing, I say. He takes a deep breath. Look, Katniss, I've been wanting to talk to you about the way I acted on the train. I mean, the last train, the one that brought us home. I knew you had something with Gail. I was jealous of him before I even officially met you, and it wasn't fair to hold you to anything that happened in the games. I'm sorry. His apology takes me by surprise. It's true that Peter froze me out, after I confessed that my love for him during the games was something of an act. 
but I don't hold that against him. In the arena, I'd played that romance angle for all it was worth. There had been times when I honestly didn't know how I felt about him. I still don't, really. I'm sorry, too, I say. I'm not, I'm not sure for what exactly, but maybe because there's a real chance I'm about to destroy him. There's nothing for you to feel sorry about. You were just keeping us alive. But I don't want us to go on like this, ignoring each other in real life and falling into the snow every time there's a camera around. So I thought if I stopped being so, you know, wounded, we could take a shot at just being friends, he said. All my friends are probably going to end up dead. But refusing Peto wouldn't keep him safe. Okay, I say. His offer does make me feel better. Less duplicitous, somehow. It would be nice if he'd come with to me with this earlier, before I knew that President Snow had other plans, and just being friends was not an option for us anymore. But either way, I'm glad we're speaking again. So what's wrong? He asks. I can't tell him. I pick at the clump of weeds. Let's start with something more basic. Isn't it strange that I don't that I know you'd risk your life to save mine, but I don't know what your favorite color is? He asks. A smile creeps into my lips. Green. What's yours? Orange, he says. Orange? Like Effie's hair? I say. A bit more muted, he says. More like sunset. Sunset. I can see it immediately. The rim of the descending sun. The sky streaked with soft shades of orange. Beautiful. I remember the tiger lily cookie. And now that Peter is talking to me again, it's all I can do not to recount the whole story about President Snow. But I know Hamish won't want me to. I better stick to small talk. You know, everyone's always raving about your paintings. I feel bad I haven't seen them, I say. Well, I've got a whole train car full. He rises and offers me his hand. Come on. It's good to feel his fingers entwined with mine again. Not for show, but an actual friendship. We walk back to the train, hand in hand. At the door, I remember. I've got to apologize to Effie first. Don't be afraid to lay it on thick, Peter tells me. So when we get back to the dining car, where the others are still at lunch, I give Effie an apology that I think is overkill, but in her mind probably just manages to compensate for my breach of etiquette. To her credit... Effie accepts graciously. She says it's clear that I'm under a lot of pressure. And her comments about the necessity of someone attending to the schedule only last about five minutes. Really, I've gotten off easy. When Effie finishes, Peter leads me down a few cars to see his paintings. I don't know what I expected. Larger versions of the flower cookies, maybe? But this is something entirely different. Different. PETA HAS PAINTED THE GAMES. SOME YOU WOULDN'T GET RIGHT AWAY IF YOU HADN'T BEEN WITH HIM IN THE ARENA YOURSELF. WATER DRIPPING THROUGH THE CRACKS IN OUR CAVE. THE DRY POND BED. A PAIR OF HANDS, HIS OWN, DIGGING FOR ROOTS. OTHERS ANY VIEWER WOULD RECOGNIZE. THE GOLDEN HORN CALLED THE CORNUCOPIA. CLOVE ARRANGING THE KNIVES INSIDE HER JACKET. One of the mutts, unmistakably the blonde, green-eyed one meant to be Glimmer, snarling as it makes its way toward us. And me, I am everywhere. High up in a tree, beating a shirt against stones in the stream, lying unconscious in a pool of blood. And one I can't place. Perhaps this is how I looked when his fever was high, emerging from a silver-gray mist that matches my eyes exactly. What do you think? he asks. I hate them, I say. I can almost smell the blood, the dirt, the unnatural breath of the mutt. All I do is go around trying to forget the arena, and you've brought it back to life. How do you remember these things so exactly? I see them every night, he says. I know what he means. Nightmares which I, I was no stranger to before the games, now plagued me whenever I sleep. 
and but the old standby, the one of my father being blowed into bits in the mines, is rare. Instead, I relive versions of what happened in the arena. My worthless attempt to save Rue, Peta bleeding to death, Glimmer's bloated body disintegrated in my hands, Cato's horrific end with the mutations. These are the most frequent visitors. Me too. Does it help to paint them out? I don't know. I think I'm a little less afraid of going to sleep at night. Or I tell myself I am, he says. But they haven't gone anywhere. Maybe they won't. Hamish just haven't. Hamish doesn't say so, but I'm sure this is why he doesn't like to sleep in the dark. No, but for me it's better to wake up with a paintbrush than a knife in my hand, he says. So you really hate them? Yes, but they're extraordinary. Really, I say, and they are, but I don't want to look at them anymore. You want to see my talent? Stina did a great job on it. <laughs> Peter laughs. Later. The train lurches forward, and I can see the land moving past us through the window. Come on, we're almost to District 11. Let's go take a look at it. We go down to the last car on the train. There are cha chairs and couches to sit on, but what's wonderful is in the back windows that the back windows retract into the ceiling so you're riding outside in the fresh air and you can see a wide sweep of the landscape. Huge open fields with herds of dairy cattle grazing in them, so unlike our own heavily wooded home. We slow slightly and I think we might be coming for another stop when a fence rises up before us. Towering at least 35 feet in the air and topped with wicked coils of barbed wire, it makes ours in District 12 look childish. My eyes quickly inspect the base, which is lined with enormous metal plates. There would be no burrowing under those, no escaping to hunt. Then I see the watchtowers, placed evenly apart, manned with armed guards, so out of place among the fields of wildflowers around them. That's something different, says Peta. Rue did give me the impression that the rules in District 11 were more harshly enforced, but I never imagined something like this. Now the crops begin, stretched out as far as the eye can see, men, women, and children wearing straw hats to keep the sun straighten, to keep off the sun, straighten up, turn our way, take a moment to stretch their backs as they watch our train go by. I can see orchards in the distance, and I wonder if that's where Rue would have worked collecting the fruit from the slimmest branches at the tops of the trees. Small communities of shacks, by comparison, the houses in the seam are upscale, spring up here and there, but they're all deserted. Every hand must be needed for the harvest. On and on it goes. I can't believe the size of District 11. How many people do you think live here? Peta asks. I shake my head. In school, they refer to it as a large district. That's all. No actual figures on the population. But those kids we see on camera waiting for the reaping each year, they can't be but a sampling of the ones who actually live here. What do they do? Have preliminary drawings? Pick the winners up ahead of time and make sure they're in the crowd? How exactly did Rue end up on stage with nothing but the wind offering to take her place? I begin to weary of the vastness, the endlessness of this place. When Effie comes to tell us to dress, I don't object. I go to my compartment and let the prep team do my hair and makeup. Senna comes in with a pretty orange frock patterned with autumn leaves. I think how much Peta will like the color. <laughs>